All right, so let's go over our um, practice on sampling distributions and our notation. So I'm just going to kind of throw out the answers here. This is the individual piece of data. This one's the sample size. This one is the sample mean. This is the number four is the mean of the whole population. Okay. Number five is the standard deviation of the distribution of all the sample proportions. So all the little sample proportions that everybody gets. All right, number six is the mean, the center of all the X bars, of the, all, the, all the sample, all the X bars everybody gets. That's the where they will be centered around. And then number seven is how varied all of those X bars will be, all of those samples means will be. Eight is, so that a P hat is one in particular uh, samples. So you get like your one proportion of blue. Nine is the standard deviation of the population. And 11, or that was 10. And then 11 is the mean of the sample proportions. Okay, so now remember these formulas. Um, these are not, don't have to be memorized. Um, because they are on the formula chart, okay? So we have the ones for proportion sampling distributions. See, it says here, sampling distribution. So that's samples. And then here was the one for means, the sampling distribution for means. Okay, so let's go to a problem. So first we are asked to describe the distribution. So give the shape, the center, and the spread. So the sample size is 200. So Remember for random, we wanna say it's stated or assumed. And in this case, it did not state that they were randomly selected. So we're assuming that the 200 loans are either randomly selected or that they are representative, representative of all such loans. Independent N is less than 10% of the population. So 200 is less than 10% of all such loans. Large enough is tricky because it all depends, mean or proportion. This one is a proportion. So it is N times P, which of course P is 0.07. That was 14. So that is greater than or equal to 10. And then the 200 times the failure is greater than or equal to 10. So approximately normal model applies. All right, our center, that's the mean of the P hats. 0.07 and the spread, so you do your formula here, your standard deviation of those p hats, okay, and that's 0.018. Now, then we're asked, um, based on what's going on, I actually think I have a, a, a mistake here. I th so what, what's going on is we're saying, hey, if we got a p hat, right here in this location. So if we got a P hat here at 10%, is that far enough away that it's not just because of sampling variability? Does that then call into question the center being centered around 0.07? See, so that's why I think it should be higher than 0.07 right here. So does is that P hat unusually high that it's not just because of sampling variability and it then thinks that you then think 0.07 is too low. So I did my p hat minus true p over the standard deviation of p hats and it's 1.67. So that is sampling variability. So no, there is no reason to think that the default rate has increased. The sample of 200 with the default rate of 10% is just 1.67 standard deviations could just be because of sampling variability. So it doesn't make me question these be, being centrally located around 0.07. Okay, next. So here we have samples of size 10. So that's interesting, okay? So my initial thought is, hmm, okay, that's making me think um, okay, that's, the size is making me worry. So it says, oh, but look here. See, here's the thing. 
the population is told to me that it is normally distributed. Well, if the population is normally distributed, then remember this. One more. Oh, maybe it is here. Remember that. Um, where is that? It's on this page. Remember this? This says that if you have small samples, so all this whole row is small samples, okay? So if you have small samples, then you should worry. But because, see, look, these three situations, all of these situations that have small samples are not normally distributed. But there is one that is. This one is okay. What made it okay? Well, because the population it came from was normal. Therefore, anything that comes out of it is good to go. So these were no go, but this one was. Okay, so that's why that sample of size 10 in that problem is okay. Because, actually, I think it's back here still. Um, so, let me see, still further back. So that sample of size 10 is good because it comes from a normal, pop, normal model. All right, even though the sample size is not large enough, the population is told to be normally distributed. Therefore, all sampling distributions that come from the population will be so as well. Okay, what will the center be? Well, the mean, see, the center of all of these X bars of all the X bars, the sample means, will be the same. So they will be centered around the same mean as the population. But how about the standard deviation? Well, the standard deviation of the X bars, the sampling distribution of the X bars, will be smaller because it is the population standard deviation divided by the square root of N. Okay? If we choose a larger sample than n equals 10, what's the effect? Well, the center remains the same, but the standard deviation will get smaller. As larger sample, less varied. Okay, moving on. So here we go. Next, we have got a sample that is chosen randomly. Oh, here we go. We are told that the population is strongly skewed to the left. So we've got this situation, strongly skewed to the left population. So then the question is, describe the sampling distribution. Well, so that's our shape, center, and spread. So guess what? The shape is still skewed to the left. I probably should have, I just kind of skipped over the random and independent and stuff because I think we have are missing some details to go that in, far into it. But I do know that it'll still be skewed to the left. Now, it'll be better, but a small sample size is not strong enough to make this sampling distribution completely, uh, approximately normal. The center will be the same as the mean, and it will be less varied, okay? So the spread will be less varied than the population because it's divided by the square root of n. But what happens if we have a large sample? So once we get to that large sample where x is greater than or equal to 30 or n is greater than or equal to 30, we now will have an approximately normal distribution. So the shape will be unimodal, symmetric, and approximately normal. Again, the mean will be the same, and the spread will be even less varied than the small sample because it's square divided by the square root of n. In general, as we make the sample larger, what's going to happen to the distribution of the data? Well, the shape gets closer and closer to the real normal model. The center um, stays centered at the population. And the spread gets less and less varied. All right. Now, what happens is, I mean, I'm thinking the extremes. You can only go so far because, remember, you have to make sure that you stay within the criteria that n is less than 10% of the population. So as you make the sample larger and larger, within reason. So you do have to maintain an assemblance of um, not getting too large. 
All right, here we go. Let's now do some computing. Assume the duration of all human pregnancies is the normal model. So, so that's so important. Don't skim over that. The population is a normal model. So that right there is important because it tells me small sample is okay. All right. Now, it's a mean of 266 with a standard deviation of 16. So see how I wrote these population mean and standard deviation. Well, so question, what percentage of pregnancies should last less than 260 days? So it's asking about the proportion of all of them. So this is about the population. Do you see how I have not changed this standard deviation? I'm going to be using this 16 right here. So 260x minus the mean over the standard deviation because it's just the population standard deviation. And then I'm going to go less than that because it asks about less than 260. So that's 35%. But look at what happens here. Suppose that this obstetrician is taking care of 60 pregnant women. So that's considered a sample of 60 pregnant women that we wonder if the average duration of these, see that's an average. So the average of the sample of 60 will, less, will be less than 260. So look here at what I've drawn. Look at this picture. So this top one, of course, is the population. I have little X's in it, population here. And this bottom one has X bars. So do you see how it's skinnier? It is the sampling distribution. Okay, and then, so do you see how, because you have X bars, you know, and you're, Standard deviation is smaller, it's scooted in. So looky here, see this 260 right here? It is easier to find a single pregnancy that is less than 260 days than it is to find a average of 60 women that averages less than 260, okay? So it's unusual because, see, look here. When we're finding that, it changed this standard deviation to 2.07. So when I X minus the mean over that standard deviation, that's now 2.9 standard deviations below the mean and only 0.19% chance. You see how little that is there that I had circled, okay? So it's much less likely. Why are they different? Well, because part A was about the probability of individual pregnancies, but part B was about the probability of an average of 60. All right, moving on. So I like this one. This one's our Lay's potato chips like we had at the beginning of the, the, um, of the year. They're gonna take a random sample off of a truck. And so this is interesting. So we are told that the fact of the matter is this one's apples. 8% of the truck is defective apples, okay? So we know 8% is bad, but, you know, you could get sampling variability, okay? So, you know, think about what's happening here. Here is 8%. Oh, yeah, hold on. Here is this, and it will be centered up. Uh, our samples will be centered around 8%. It's a proportion problem, so I got P hats in here. So most of the samples we take will show 8% defective. Some a little more, some a little less. Okay, so most of them will show 8% defective. All right, so I'll put 0 0.08 here in the middle, 0 0.08 in the middle. But the interesting thing is that you, the whole truckload will be rejected if more than 5% of the sample. So guess what? That means here is 0.05. So all of these samples would be more than 5% and make me reject 
the truckload. Now, these ones, the farmer's going to be lucky, and he's going to get to get to um, unload 8% defective apples when he really shouldn't, okay? But anyway, so that's what's happening. Now, we are asked to just go ahead and describe the distribution, so let's get that out of the way. So remember, we say random, write the word random, stated that that was randomly selected 150 apples. So I'm defining that sample. I'm saying stated or assumed, and I'm saying that it was randomly selected or randomly assigned. Okay. Independent N is less than 10% of the population. So 150 is less than 10% of all such apples on this truck. Okay. Um, now, again, the idea there is that means that that little sample is insignificant in comparison to the whole truck. So that that little sample is going to, on average, show 8% defective. Well, somebody comes along and takes another little sample. Well, this has been, this was so small of an amount taken out that this one is expected to show 8% defective as well on average. Okay, see that expected amount doesn't change. Okay, large enough is tricky because it all depends. Mean or proportion. This is a proportion problem. So means is 30, but proportions is at least 10 successes and at least 10 failures. So I have that 150 times, oopsie, this is 0 0.08. <clears throat> So that's not bad. That's supposed to be 0 0.08. And um, that equals 12, which is greater than or equal to 10, and so on. And then we had 188 failures. It, so approximately normal model applies. So the center is this right here, where the C, the mean of the P hats will, so the center will be located around 0 0.08. And there's the standard deviation. Okay, so here we go. Remember I told you, here's what's happening. Our um, samples will be centered around 8% defective. And so then we want to go here is 5% defective. And all of these will make the truck get rejected. So we find the Z score for that 5. That's what this is doing. And then we norm CDF above that. All right, next here, a waiter believes that the distribution of his tips has a, uh, has a model that is skewed to the right. All right, so this is telling us the population is skewed right. So I think that makes sense because this waiter, you know, most of them are going to give you somewhere in the 15 to 20% tip range or some a little lower. Um, but, you know, mom's going to come in and grandma's going to come in and some of your friends. Well, I don't know about the friends, if they're cheap or not, but you would get a really good tip from them. So you're going to have some out upper outlier tips. So you're going to have skewed to the right population. All right. The mean is 960 and the standard deviation is 540. Explain why you cannot determine the probability of getting a tip at least $20. Well, the normal model doesn't apply. That's why. So therefore, so the distribution of tips not normally distributed. It was stated to be skewed to the right. Can you estimate the probability that the next four parties will have an average? That's This is now sampling distributions, X bars of samples of size four. And that says to me, small sample size. So the sampling distribution for samples of size four will not be normally distributed either because the sample size is not large enough to overcome the skew. Now, is it likely that his 10 parties today will average at least $15? I still don't know. I still cannot compute this because for the same reason as part B, not large enough. Okay, I need to have it greater than or equal to 30. Well, here we go. Suppose the waiter waits on about 40 parties over a weekend of work. Describe the sampling distribution for the weekend's tips for the waiter. So we're going to use a weekend as a sample. 
and we'll average those 40. So we're going to do our shape, so our random independent large enough. So the 40 parties are not randomly selected from all of his parties. Um, Unless it was like a randomly selected weekend, which we don't know. So we could put, so we're assuming that these were randomly selected weekend, or we're assuming that this weekend is representative of all of his weekends or all such parties. Okay. So see, I had to make some kind of stipulation that, okay, I'm assuming that it's representative. See, your conditions might not be perfect. But you can state the reservations you have about them or the things that need to happen for this to then follow the statistical analysis. Okay. Independent, N is less than 10%. So I imagine 40 is less than 10% of all the parties. And the large enough, yes, 40 is greater than or equal to 30. So the approximately normal model applies. Um, this center. So we expect, so his weekend's going to be an X bar, okay? An average of the 40. So this, they, X bars will be centered around 960 as an average tip with that standard deviation of 85 cents, okay? Next, estimate the probability that he will earn at least $500 in tips. So, whoa. So see what I have written here? That means that this X bar is 500 divided by 40. So see, I had to back that off 500 tips that weekend. So I had to say, okay, that's an X bar of 1250. All right. And I gave you the hint to be able to do that. So here we have our information. There's our population mean, and then our sampling dis our sample mean. And then here's the standard deviation, how varied all of those X bars is, okay? So there's our X minus the mean, or our X bar minus the mean over the standard deviation of X bars. Um, it's pretty far out there. So we expect, on average, them to be centered around $9.60, and this 1250 is 3.41 standard deviations out. So what you think? Is he going to be able to depend on averaging 1250 per tip on that on a weekend? Um, pretty much no. So he should not expect to be getting $500 on a weekend. How much do you expect to the waiter to make on the best 10% of weekends? Ah, so do you remember how to do that? Do you have to say, oh, top 10%, that's the lower 90%, okay? So remember that the percent is not the Z-score, but you use that percent to find the Z-score. So your percent is not the Z, it's not the Z, you use percent to get the Z, inverse norm of the area below is the Z at that spot. So there we have our Z-score and we're gonna solve for the average. Now, that means, okay, so it says, how much do you expect the waiter to make? Okay, so I was wondering about this. I expect him to make 1069 on average, okay? So I didn't know if they wanted to know how much is that for 40 parties, because it says on the weekends. So if you multiplied that by 40, it would come out to be 427.60. So that's about what he would expect. Okay, now here comes um, a comparison of two values. And so we're gonna be doing some combining here. So this is gonna pull into uh, you know, the ideas of our um, random variables that we did before we got into these sampling distributions. So this is gonna kind of meld together the first quiz and this second component the second half of the chapter, first half and the second half of unit six. So here we go. We're talking about IQs. Now, what we, we don't, I didn't start off talking about individual students. I went ahead and started with samples of size three. So we're dealing with X bars. I even gave you the hints of, of let's, here's what we need to do. So here's 
our samples of size three shall be centered around 130 with this standard deviation, eight over the square root of three. And at West State, here's your numbers from the top. All right, now, what is the difference between them? Now, I just finished grading a lot of the quizzes that were related to this, and there were still people who missed the standard deviation rule. So yes, finding the difference, I'm doing East State minus the West State. So yes, it's an average of 10 IQ points difference. With what standard deviation? Remember that even if you're subtracting the random variables, the variability, the uncertainty, what's happening gets bigger. So this was still plus, no minus, no minus. Your variability doesn't ever get smaller. Every time you weren't sure what you had in the box, you weren't sure what you poured out into the bowl, so you're even more unsure of what's left. It gets bigger. So that standard deviation was 7.39. So now we're going to do this question. So what's the probability that their average IQ is at least five points higher for West? for the three West State ones. So what I did was I centered it here. Okay, so here I, I, I have to draw a picture of what's happening. So on average, I expect all of the samples to be around a difference of 10. And look, you must define the order you're gonna subtract. So I'm doing the East State minus the West State. Okay, so it's gonna be there about 10. But I wanted to see where West was higher. So I had to think, okay, what's happening? So, of course, over here, the East is higher. So here's zero, where they're equal. And then over here, West is higher. But I don't just want any old West higher. I want West to be five higher. So I had to have my difference between them negative five, not just zero. It wasn't just, where is it bigger? It was, what's the probability? It's five more. So that's how that was different than the ones that we've done like on the quiz. So here we go. There is our X minus mean over the standard deviation and that's our Z score. And so we only had a 2.12% chance that the average of the three West State students will be five points higher in IQ than the average of the three East State. All right, I think that's it. And so now you're gonna warm up with this, um, these two pages, maybe two or three pages, um, because then that's what you're going to do for our quiz tomorrow. So good luck to you on that warm up. I hope that this going through this in detail helped make some sense to you.